I've rarely heard of people that have decided to make an ethical change, but then decide to go back and not follow those ethics over time. It would be almost equivalent to someone saying that, okay, I'm no longer going to be racist, but then years later, or however long later, they will go back to being racist. That's not something that you typically see. Hello and welcome to the Vegan Luna podcast. We're sitting here with a super special individual all the way from the East Coast in Atlanta, Georgia. His name is Chris Eubanks, but he goes by the name Soul Eubanks. And uh, I'm so excited to have him on because we've been talking for a while and he also lives in the Southern region of the United States. So I know that that's a very, very different type of place. I lived in Houston, Texas for three years. So I can understand how the South is and, and the ideas about animals and the beliefs about animals and the beliefs about food and diet and all that sort of stuff. So I'm really excited to talk about that uh, from a different perspective. I haven't talked to anyone on this podcast um, about the South and that region. So I'm really excited for that. So before we get started, I have a couple questions. I call them my quick vegan questions. They're designed to be relatively quick, um, icebreaker questions. Uh, but if you feel like really passionate about any of the questions, you can feel free to continue. So question number one, what is the difference between an animal rights activist like yourself and someone that advocates for specifically a healthy plant-based diet? The biggest difference is that one is based on your ethics towards animals and how you view animals. And the other one is strictly about how you eat food. So when it comes to animal rights activism, it's about trying to create a world where people see animals as a part, well, one with all beings and not causing them suffering when you have the ability not to. And a plant-based diet has nothing to do with ethics. It is just about trying to, I guess if you want to say, it's typically people that are, more concerned about their health. But you could technically be on a plant-based diet and it be unhealthy. I guess if you were just a junk food plant-based person. But typically people that are plant-based tend to care about their health. But those are two totally different things. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of people look at veganism sometimes as, um, I don't know the right word, but when someone say they used to be vegan and they're now no longer vegan, it's because they were only adopting, typically they were only adopting the diet of a vegan, but they weren't adopting the ethical stance of a vegan. So it makes us look like we're wishy-washy at times. So that is so important to the movement to make that distinguish, um, to make that, to separate those because if you don't, it, got, it kind of gives the misperception that people are going from vegan and no longer being vegan, when that's not the case. I typically haven't, I've rarely heard of people that have decided to make an ethical change, but then decide to go back and not follow those ethics over time. It would be almost equivalent to someone saying that, okay, I'm no longer going to be racist, but then years later, or however long later, they will go back to being racist. That's not something that you typically see. So typically, if you have ethics that don't condone abusing animals, those ethics don't change over time. Diets change over time. And someone that is maybe eating a predominantly plant-based diet, or even just, let's say, a vegan diet, right? Uh, they could potentially be buying leather products or buying other animal products that are that are harming animals that is totally separate from food like leather and silk and down and, and some of those ones and or even even products of animal testing uh, and and Absolutely. so that's that's why it's that is why it is important to kind of differentiate between the ethics absolutely all right great yes. so next question um, this one question is a little bit maybe controversial, but I think that it's a really important topic um, and also kind of what's going on with, in the world right now. It almost seems like things aren't getting better on this particular topic, and you just brought up a good point, an analogy. So question number two, is the dairy industry, or maybe even the meat industry, but pretty much the dairy industry, are they racist? Well, that is a very complex question. I think it's very easy to say yes, but... <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny because I don't even want to limit it to the dairy industry being racist. 
I think the bigger problem with all of these industries that exploit other beings is that they are inherently racist, discriminatory, sexist. They're all under the same umbrella. So I don't think they're specifically trying to be racist, but I think when you accept the fact that you can exploit others, racism just kind of falls in line with it. Now, I know specifically a lot of people ask this question because of how cows were, um, how the African-American community drinking cow's milk was kind of pushed upon us, kind of like a lot of things that was pushed upon us after the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so I think it's just kind of, it's so discriminatory. I will say that, um, you know, it's not something that it was part of African culture to consume cow's milk. That's something that uh, people of color were forced to do more when we were brought over to America. Um, so in a sense, it was forced on us in that way. But a lot of our culture was stripped from us. So it wasn't just the consumption of the foods we eat, but it was our languages, how we talk, our vernacular. So many other things were stripped from us. So I think consuming cow's milk was just one of those things that kind of just got thrown in their homes. Do you think that maybe certain parts of the U.S., like maybe the South, has a more concentrated amount of maybe certain, certain unhealthy foods? And then maybe parts like maybe on the West Coast, like where I'm at right now in LA and San Diego and San Francisco, you have different kinds of foods that are, that are maybe more healthy. When you look at the, the Mason-Dixon line, all of the states that are south, you know, unfortunately, those are a lot of the states where you have the highest rates of obesity. And a lot of that is a lot of the food that we eat, a lot of the, you know, the soul food, the cultural food, and how it originated for us in America. Now, we still have those foods without those negative origins, but it's not as widely as uh, accepted yet. So a lot of the foods that we eat still contain a lot of animal products. But one of the good things about veganism now is that we're starting to see a lot of vegan foods be reimagined and reinvented. And I see a lot, especially in Atlanta, is so many plant-based and, and vegan options. And we are really redoing some of that cultural conditioning around the foods that we have been um, accustomed to eating. We're really starting to change that. Yeah, also on this same topic, do you think that some of the, like the factory farms and some of like the hog farms and some of the, the cattle farms or, and, and some of those farms where they have a lot of the animals in a large amount are more commonly in some of these um, areas of more minorities in the country. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at a lot of these facilities, they're typically placed in lower income communities. They're placed in, play, uh, I mean, and even not only the locations where they are placed, but also the workers. These are the workers that are typically exploited that don't have a lot of opportunities. They're typically minorities or, you know, people who don't have a lot of options. And, you know, unfortunately in America, that's a lot of people of color uh, a lot of the times. So, yeah, so not only are the people inside of these starter houses being exploited and taken advantage of, but also the conditions. When you look at all of the manure and the waste and the runoff and how that affects the water and the air quality in these environments, you know, these facilities aren't being placed in communities where there are high income brackets. They're being, you know, placed in, you know, the places where a lot of the red lining happening, uh, happens in because obviously people who have wealth and access, they don't want these facilities near their community. They don't want to smell the feed lots of hundreds of thousands of cows and, you know, the 65 million pounds of waste that can come from one feed lot every day. They, why would anyone choose to have that in their community? So they're able to have these facilities in places that's not in their community. So that obviously that's, included in environmental racism. And like I said earlier, these industries are so exploited that all of that gets sucked into it. So you have things like environmental racism, um, classism, it, it all unfortunately is under this big ball of discrimination. Yeah, one of the most powerful scenes I saw was in Cowspiracy when they, when they go to the hog farms 
and they they show that in North Carolina the families they talk to some of the families nearby and they have the one this one scene where this older an, a, a mom was carrying her child and she was talking about some of the some of the breathing problems that she had and and then she showed the child and this child must have been like six months old looked like so young and the child had breathing problems could barely breathe as a six month old because of the air quality because of the feces that was nearby um from the hog farms and it was just that was one of the most powerful scenes i've seen it was it was truly unbelievable yeah yeah so my next question is what do you think is the most effective social media platform for animal rights activism so i personally think i have two answers for this i personally think it's youtube because of all the things that you can do on youtube the amount of content and the fact that YouTube is almost like the new television. People don't watch a lot of TV as much, but we consume YouTube a lot. I mean, it's this world's second largest search engine. So I think it's YouTube personally because of the amount of content, how long you can put the content on there. Like when you look at platforms like, well, I guess Facebook has some of that, but you have to log into facebook uh, typically you don't i don't think you even have to log into youtube you can just search videos but you can have videos on there for hours you can have content on there that's uh, a few minutes it's just so much that you can do with youtube now i also want to say that the other part of the answer is whatever platform works best for that person's personality so with me I kind of stumbled upon Twitter and that's the most, that's been the most effective form of activism for me and my personality. It's just something about how I am as a person that just gravitates towards that platform. So I'm able to use it more effectively than other types of platforms. So I do think it's YouTube, but I also think it is the platform that suits that person's personality. Some people are more, uh, oratory and they can talk and do things like be in front of the camera and talk on YouTube. Other people like me are better with, you know, thinking out their words and thoughts and not having to say something in front of a camera right at the moment they're being filmed and they can ponder and think. So yeah, I think it depends on the person, but in general, I think YouTube is probably the strongest. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And for me so far, like I've, I've had success on, on each one, you know, varying, varying degrees of success, but I've never seen anything quite like TikTok as far as, as far as fast growth, like really, really fast growth. Uh, and I, and I, and I also find it to be fun. Uh, and so one of the things that, that can be very tough being an activist is that you, you do feel sad. Sometimes you do feel down in the dumps. You do feel like, man, is this ever going to change? You know, are people ever going to change? Are people going to get it? Are we going to, are people going to wake up, you know, fast enough? Right. Uh, and so, sometimes that really gets to you and can bring you down, right? And so when I'm on TikTok, I feel a little bit more up- uplifted, even though I still got a lot of hate comments, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel a lot more uplifted in, in the fun that I'm having and, and the engagement and just the, the overall creativity. I, I truly believe one of the things that about humans in general, I think our superpower is creativity. I think that, that, I think that separates us, you know, from so many different species and animals. You know, I think that's like our superpower. Uh, is creativity and and TikTok really brings out the creativity unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know if there's any other app that that encourages creativity and says, "Hey, we want you to be creative." Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, so those are the quick vegan questions. Great job. Uh, so now what I want to do is give you a chance to introduce yourself. So who are we talking to? Oh, well, I guess I am Christopher Eubanks. A lot of people know me as So Eubanks. And I am a kid from Ohio, like LeBron James. I was born in Ohio, but I've been in. Are you a LeBron East fan? Point. Oh yeah, I'm a huge LeBron. Okay, fan. cool. LeBron. I'm a huge LeBron, LeBron fan too. Yeah. I'm a huge. Yeah. LeBron fan. on the court, off the court, I could we could talk about that all day. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I was born in Cincinnati, but I've been in Atlanta since I was about three years old, and that's really home to me. I grew up a huge hip hop fan. I'm still a hip hop fan. Like I love hip hop. That was my first love. I, I used to like make music, used to rap. I actually still have my album on my website. 
and it's something that I, I still loosely like to do, but I haven't been writing or making music consistently for a long time, for maybe four or five years at this point. But um, I'm a huge hip hop fanatic. Like I love underground, 90s boom bap. I'm just really obsessed with not only how hip hop is as a, a form of art, but <clears throat> just the tools, the tales, the stories, the perspectives of a lot of people, a lot of young black men in America, which is something growing up I obviously related to. But um, yeah, I'm a huge hip hop fan. I've always been a creative. I, I used to draw a lot. Just anything creative, I was into video and film production in high school. I went to a, a magnet high school where actually Outkast went to the same high school, TLC, Escape. So it's like just, this hub of creativity. Um, so I've always been creative. And at around the time I graduated from high school, you know, that was around the time where society tells you you have to do X, Y, and Z, so you have to get a job. You have to start the path of determining the rest of your life, which is crazy, but that's kind of the way that we've been culturally conditioned. So I got into finance and working at a bank for about seven years. In the beginning, I liked it. It was customer service, but after three or four years, I hated it. So I just kind of made an exit plan. I was like, okay, I gotta work the next couple of years to save up X amount of money. And if I reach this goal, I'll be able to quit my job in three years. Hit the goal, told my manager, I appreciate the fact that I've been able to work here for a while, but it's time for me to leave and pursue creativity and creative endeavors. So that was about five or six years ago. And at the time, I wasn't vegan. I was just, I've been vegetarian, I'll rewind a little bit, for 10 years of my life before that. But it wasn't for any ethical reasons. It was just health. So I actually was vegetarian. Then I started back eating animals. And around, I would say, four or five years ago when I left my job, and I had enough money to survive for maybe a, a good two years or so, you just kind of start to put, when you don't have to worry about the basic things that, you know, we have to go to work for, like food, clothes, and shelter, like I kind of had that figured out for two years, you start to think about more things and what really makes you happy and the kind of person that you want to be. And this is how I was really introduced into the ethical side of what veganism is. And I saw conspiracy, and then I just kind of went from there. So that's kind of like my path into how I became who I am today. That's my yeah, story. So what would you say would be something that, or a few things maybe that really led you to go vegan? Because so many people right now are making that, are having that same question. Why do I go vegan? Why should I go vegan? Is it, is it going to be good for me? Is it worth it? You know, what are the benefits? You know, what is, what is it for you? the reasons why you went vegan? The reason I went vegan was because I watched the movie Cowspiracy or the documentary. My goal was to really be the best environmentalist that I could be. I wanted to reduce my carbon footprint as much as possible. And once I saw Cowspiracy, I realized how bad eating animals was for the environment. So that prompted me to stop eating animal products entirely. And like I said, I was vegetarian for 10 years, so not eating animal products wasn't far-fetched to me. It was something that I was somewhat familiar with already. But, you know, a few uh, months before that, before I saw Cowspiracy, I was kind of already on the path of becoming vegan because I was like, you know, I don't really want to eat animal products. I don't really feel comfortable doing it. It wasn't as much as of an ethical decision, but ethics did play a part in it. So once I saw Cowspiracy, like all the dots connected, I was like, oh, well, this is really cruel to the animals, although Cowspiracy didn't focus on the cruelty, it showed the cruelty. So I saw that and saw the environmental impact and decided to go vegan right on the spot. So um, once I went vegan, um, well, so that's part of why I went vegan. But even with that being said, that's still technically just not vegan, that's more plant-based. Because at the time, it wasn't clearly about not abusing animals. That was kind of like a bonus. It was like, I don't have to contribute to the suffering of animals and I don't have to worry about 
the unhealthy things that come along with eating animals. So I was like, okay, I'm a vegan. But once you really start to understand the definition of veganism and understand that it has nothing to do with diet, that's just a component of it. I understand that I wasn't vegan, I was just plant-based. And I would say about four or five months into being plant-based, I started to see more videos on YouTube where people like Earthling Ed and James Aspie, they were really starting to make a name for themselves doing street outreach with Anonymous for the Voiceless. And I saw a video from Gary Urofsky. Once I saw the best speech, I think it's, what is it? The best speech you'll ever hear? Yep. That's when I became vegan. Like that's when it clicked. Like, okay, this is an ethical decision. This isn't about uh, the environment. This isn't about my health. This is about what kind of person do I want to be? Do I want to be the type of person that contributes to animal cruelty when I have the ability not to? And that's when it clicked for me that, no, I'm not going to contribute to this because I have the ability not to. So that's when I became vegan. So that, so I guess that's the, I guess a long answer to how I became vegan. Watch Cowspiracy, a few months later, let's watch Gary Urofsky and saw the ethics and that made it connect. Yeah, one thing I wanna talk about too is some of the challenges within different parts of the country. So I lived in Houston for three years, like I said, and on every single corner, there's fast food everywhere. If it's not a fast food place, because it's still Texas, right? There's barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's not barbecue, because it's still the South, it's soul food, right? So you got the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes and the collard greens and all that good stuff, macaroni, yeah. right? The macaroni and all that, right? And then that was, that was it. I didn't really see, as far as restaurants go, too many of the health spots. Houston's a big city, so there was a few. But at the time, I wasn't vegan when I was living there. And so I definitely didn't see anything that was standing out or sticking out to me that was like health, health, health. Um, and I gained probably about 60 to 70 pounds oh, wow. in three years living there and eating there. Um, but then also, if it wasn't like the soul food and if it wasn't the fast food and if it wasn't the barbecue, it's also really close to Tex uh, Mexico. So they have Tex-Mex, right? So mm -hmm. if it wasn't, I mean, basically <laughs> I had, I, and I was making good money there, I had the ability to eat out every day. Not everyone has that ability. Yeah. I had the ability to eat out every day. And so when I was eating out um, most days, it was always the junk food and there's always, or the soul food, but I always had like four or five options of really unhealthy food. And so yeah. when I moved to back, I'm from California. When I moved back to California and I was living in Los Angeles, and that's also when I went vegan, I realized how much different it was as far as health goes, right? I, I started realizing, man, LA, yes, it has fast food. It's the fast foods everywhere. Um, and yes, it has, you know, there's probably barbecue spots and soul food spots, right? But definitely not as much as in the South. But there's also a heck of a lot more healthy options, right? So I do understand the difference and I know that it, that it can be challenging. Can you speak to living in the South and, and maybe some of the challenges and how you overcome those challenges? That's a great point because in the South, we are used to eating animal-based foods. Like it is a staple in our culture. I mean, obviously it is a staple of American culture, unfortunately. But specifically in the South, it's a lot more conservative. So we are around, you know, we don't think twice about typically like when I was growing up, like I can remember going to grocery stores, seeing pig feet in jars. And it was just like a common thing. Like it wasn't anything to think twice about. I remember my grandmother uh, cooking uh, pig intestines, chitlins. And it was just like this. Well, I mean, it wasn't something that was done all the time, but it's crazy because chitlins have kind of weirdly been like a delicacy in like Southern culture. And uh, it's just weird when you think about what they actually are, the intestines of a pig and how awful they smell. I don't know if you've ever smelled pig intestines being cooked. It is, I've never smelled a dead body, but it has to be the, it, it's the closest thing I can think of. I have but, um, been inside a slaughterhouse, a pig slaughterhouse. Yeah. And so I, maybe it's a similar smell. I've seen the intestines yeah. on the floor, um, mm. but I didn't see it cooking. So yeah. yeah, I think cooking is probably, it maybe exacerbates it, it, exacerbates it. I don't know for sure, but it's, but I just say that to say that um, the way that we view animals in the South for food, is probably not the same way that more 
uh, liberal states, like in the West, probably view animals for food. So I do know that in other parts of the country, there's more, there's been more of a, a challenge to it. Where in the South, I think we're just now finally starting to challenge it more because I even understand with a lot of my family members, you know, I'm at home and in my personal life, I'm not very outspoken about veganism. It always comes up because people know that I am an animal rights activist. But um, I know that most of my family members and friends are probably never going to not eat animals. It's just a reality that I've accepted because we come from this ingrained culture where eating animals is a part of everything that we've done. It's, it's been a part of our culture. So not doing that would almost feel like a slap in the face to our past culture. And so so just, uh, just to kind of reference what you're talking about, yeah, it, it's, it was a challenge up until the point where, up until I made a decision, it was about the ethics. When you, realize, when you realize animals aren't food, like then, exactly. you're like then you just see everything different. Like that's just not food. Yeah. Exactly. So I consider it, you know, someone was, I was speaking to someone at, at Cuba Truth about it. And I compared it to being in a committed relationship. So if I'm in a committed relationship with my wife and I vow to, and I'm not married, I'm just using this as an example. Um, so if I was married and I dedicated myself to my wife and said that I'll never cheat on you or um, break the vows of our marriage, it doesn't matter how beautiful or attractive uh, another woman is, I'm committed to this. This is something that I've devoted my ethics to. So that's when it really clicked when I, that's when it no longer became a challenge. When I said, oh, I'm going to find a way because I know it's possible that I don't have to eat animals and survive. So once I made an ethical decision, it became a lot easier to just maybe research or hang around people and find out recipes because now I was 100% devoted to not consuming these products that come from suffering. When it's not a motive, when the ethics aren't a motivating factor, it can be a little bit more difficult. And sometimes even, well not now, but when I first became vegan, when I was convinced that I was going to do it for ethical reasons, it was a little bit of a challenge. But anytime you do something new, it's a bit of a learning curve. But you know, a couple of months in, it's nothing, you don't even think about it. It's just yeah. something that you do. I like that analogy. That's a great analogy. One that I use that's similar to that is like, not in that same kind of analogy, but the similar point is that there's two types of, of people, you know what I mean? Um, that there's the types of people that think veganism is hard and the people that think veganism is easy. You know, the, the difference between those two is the one that think the people that think it's really, really hard are only thinking about themselves. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss bacon, man, I'm going to miss cheese. Oh, I'm going to miss this. They're only thinking about them. The ones that think it's easy, they think about the victims. They think about the ones that are being thrown into gas chambers, into, into slaughterhouses, you know, having their throats slit and their testicles ripped off and all these horrible things. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the difference. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So tell us about now that you, oh, I wanted to ask you, you, you said, we would talk, the question before was about the challenges, right? So walk me through, if you walk outside your door right now, right, what are some places that you can go to nearby um, and, and get the food that you need? It's all the same places that all of my friends and families go to. I still go to the Chinese restaurants. Um, when we go out to eat, I think I went to a, a steakhouse once and I still found food there. Um, but just in close proximity to me right now, there's a Kroger up the street, which I go to all the time. And Kroger, for anyone that is transitioning into veganism or thinking about it, if you have a Kroger that's close by you, they really are very accommodating with a lot of their vegan options. Um, I also surprisingly have an Aldi's right next to the Kroger, and they're actually very accommodating. They have a lot of uh, vegan plant-based options. There's they're, one... There's one play, there's one a company, or I don't know if it's a company, but one vegan brand in uh, Atlanta that I see all the time that I really want to try. It's the Slutty Vegan. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so have you been there? And I know that they have like the Slutty Vegan bacon or something like that. So I haven't been there only because the lines are so ridiculously long. It's literally, I had a friend who went to the grand opening. She said she was in, uh, in line for eight hours, but typically the wait, yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
So typically the wait time is about two to three hours before you can get your food. Um, some people say, oh, you know, I walked by and the line was, it was only a 45 minute wait and that's a good day. Me, I don't wait for food that long. I just- <laughs> When I'm hungry, possible. 45 minutes. Exactly, I just, it's not possible for me to stand in line. So that's the only reason I haven't been there. But that that's actually very close to where I uh, grew up. So right now that's probably about 30 minutes away from me. But in terms of where I grew up, that's maybe 15 minutes away from where I used to live. So it's right. And then, you know, one of the reasons that she, that Pinky Cole created Slutty Vegan was because she was vegan, but there weren't a lot of the foods that she was accustomed to eating that had, maybe there were some, but they just weren't all central in like a, in the environment that she was in. So she just decided to make them and boom, you know, a couple of years later, you got celebrities, you know, endorsing how good the food is. It's just incredible to see what she's done. And she's literally like just not too far down the street from where I grew up. That's cool. And they're expanding and growing and some of their products are going to be, are going in the grocery store, right? Exactly. Yeah. They have, uh, I think two more restaurants opening up and these are rest the places where they're opening. I know one is in Morrow, which is kind of like South of Atlanta, but the other one I think is in Bankhead. And for those that don't know, Bankhead is like, it's like the hood. Like it's, I just, it's, it's real, you know? So for her to have one there, it's like, it's beautiful because it's going to just expand people's perception of what veganism can be. Yeah. I saw, um, you probably seen it, but I saw a video where um, this, this, um, this guy was opening up a, a vegan restaurant like that that had all the kind of soul food and like a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. And they opened up in Oakland. And they opened up right next to a McDonald's. And I think they, that McDonald's closed down and the food was oh, so wow. amazing. It was a nice story. Maybe you've seen it, um, but it was, it was an amazing story. And it was, really was cool. kind of like that, like they opened up in the hood yeah. and uh, in, a, in a really tough part of Oakland. And, uh, and it was just so cool to see the success that they had and, and, and that they were able to, you know, close down the McDonald's nearby because it was better. <laughs> yeah. It tasted better than the McDonald's and it was yeah. better for you. Yeah. So that was, that was wow. a cool story. That's beautiful. So tell us about, um, now that you have focused your, um, your efforts on animal rights, tell us some of the things that you do related to animal rights that, that really help the animals. Uh, so one of the, a couple of the things that I've done just in my short term, uh, I guess I would say career of animal rights activism, is I'm one of the organizers for the local anonymous for the uh, Voices chapter. For those that don't know, I'm pretty sure you probably do know, but if you don't know, that's an organization that shows slaughterhouse footage to the public. We have conversations about a vegan lifestyle when people are watching these slaughterhouse footage. So I'm one of the organizers in Atlanta for that organization. I'm one of the organizers for the Atlanta Animal Save chapter. For those of you all that don't know, a, a save is where we go to a slaughterhouse and as the trucks, well, we protest outside of the slaughterhouse and as the trucks are coming in with the animals, if we can, we have the truck stop for us for two minutes. We take pictures, give the animals water, we kind of give them all the compassion that they will receive before they're going into the slaughterhouse to be killed. Um, so I'm one of the organizers for that. I've helped last year, we had the first Atlanta Animals Rights March and that was so monumental. I'm one of the organizers for that. I've done an internship with the Humane League, Early, I think that was 20, early, no, early 2018. Yes, I think it was early 2018. I did an internship with them. I learned a lot about how the organization runs. And uh, I just try to do as much activism as I can. I, I do online activism. On top of that, more people are online as well. It's not just, it's not just activists are online. Everybody's more people. Everybody's going online more than than they than they were before. Can you share a little bit about? I know that there was a little bit of controversy within Anonymous for the Voiceless, and some people decided to step down as organizers and and stuff like that. I don't know all the specifics. Do you want to talk about um, some of the anything like that? Uh, well, well, which I mean, honestly, it's been a few times so this has happened. So I don't know if it's one in particular that you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone recently 
maybe if you were to like tell me some names or some the particular situation, maybe. I, could, I understand that some people were upset with Paul and maybe some of the things that he had said. Um, so I don't want to know. I don't want to say this was the situation, but no, I won't even say it because I don't even want to like misrepresent what he said if I don't know what he said. I will say that I do know that there have been times where, you know, maybe Paul uh, or just the leadership in general has said, made statements and they just were taken either the wrong way or I don't know if the wording was the best. And it's caused people to branch off from Anonymous for the Voices. And a lot of people don't like the fact that Anonymous for the Voices have those, uh, have the Guy Fawkes masks and we wear those. So there's a lot of controversy about but that's not only singled out in Anonymous for the Voiceless. Yeah. Any, any organization that fights for change is going to be controversial. Even when you look at PETA, they stay getting bashed. They stay by, you know, people in the animal rights community also, they don't like them. You look at what's going on, what's happened with DXE in the past. Um, at the, I forgot the name of the convention, but the Kamala Harris situation, I don't know if you are, uh, were aware of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, you know, that comes along with fighting for change. You may yeah. say something that may not be in the best light, or you may say, say, may say something that may misrepresent how you actually feel. People take it the wrong way, and they want to branch off and leave from the organization. It's just a part of having to be the head or represent an organization. It's, it's, so it's just almost, you know, virtually inevitable that there's no organization out today, even Black Lives Matter, people, certain people within, I, I have friends that, you know, that don't like them. I'm talking about people of color. Some of my closest friends that I've grown up with, they just despise them. And, you know, it's, it's not really uh, much you can do, but people- For sure. Just, even even the times in the the civil rights movement, there was people that just the, of color that didn't agree with with Martin Luther King and his style and his and the way that he went about certain things. Yeah, I totally agree. And the thing that I'm I fear the most is that not not for anonymous for the voices, but any of them is that it takes some of the things that happen are distractions from from what we're what we're fighting for. You know, mm -hmm. and and the thing that fears uh, makes me fear the most is the the infighting within the vegans mm -hmm. and the 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 fighting when when how, how why are we why are we fighting each other when we we should all be fighting for the animals you know because yeah. they're the they're the biggest victims that we have right here no matter honestly no matter how victimized you know some of the people are not saying that it justifies but if if, if a human is victimized or anything like that for whatever situation in any any organization it still never pales into comparison to what these animals are going through you know, and, and uh, not to say that it's not okay, I'm not saying it's okay to be bad to humans or anything like that, yeah, but, yeah. but no human in any of these organizations has ever been truly harmed and damaged like these animals in these factory farms, you know, and that's, that's one of the parts that, that, that pains me to see, you know, even, even back not too long ago, just the fighting of the Impossible Burger and yeah. all, all the infighting of, of you know, Oh, that's not vegan, and now you're not vegan. Mm -hmm. You're supporting that. You're this. You're... It's like, hold on a minute. Like, my opinion, my opinion is this company's trying. Yeah. Like they're trying to do better. Did, if they they made a mistake, yeah. Did you make a mistake? Were you perfect? No. Like nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes, and I think that if we took that approach, you know, to like try to have that empathy, like how do, how can we have so much empathy for animals sometimes? And, and so little empathy for humans. Humans are animals too, you know? And yeah. so it, it just kind of, it just kind of really is a tough situation sometimes. You know, what I've come to understand is that I think when I first got into the animal rights activism and, and into the community, you know, for some odd reason, I just thought everybody was gonna get along. It was gonna be kumbaya. Everybody was gonna be on one same page. We're all fighting for the animals and, we're all going to just work together and it's going to be harmony. And now I understand that that's just not possible. That's not how humans work. So now I kind of, I definitely have more of a skew, well not a skew, but a more real perception of how humans interact with each other. And 
it would be great for that to happen. Like I would love for us to um, be in harmony when we fight for the rights of animals, but it's probably never going to happen, honestly. And I've accepted that and I understand it. And so now when I see it, um, I'm just like, oh, okay, it's happening. Because like you said, you referenced the civil rights movement happened then. You know, you had people that were um, pro-Malcolm, pro-Martin, you had them in their different areas of the civil rights movement uh, trying to achieve change in the way that they wanted. And it's, it's almost inevitable. Well, it is inevitable. So at this point, I just accept it. I just look at it like it is what it is. Yeah. I always say if you take a group of 100 people in any, in any group, you choose any group, whether it's a certain religion, whether it's a certain organization, whether it's a certain company, you just take a hundred people, random people, right? Out of any group, you're going to get a couple, a couple bad apples. <laughs> you know, you're going to get a couple people that are just don't fit right, don't mesh well, yeah. don't, don't know how to be socially connected with other people. And, and, and you can, you can point to those people and, and say, well, that defines that movement or that defines that organization or that defines that religion. That's wrong. That, exactly. is, that is totally Absolutely. wrong to say like these small little outliers within will define the whole thing. You have to look at the whole picture and you have to look at, you know, the message and you have to look at the, the, the reasons behind everything. And even when I, I live, was living in the Middle East, what, I'm, what I was taught about Muslim culture and Islam culture, you know, in the U.S. is nothing like what I saw over mm-hmm. there, you know, when I actually lived there and I was actually part of it. Same wow. thing with the animal agriculture industry right? What I saw on TV, what they showed in the media, you know, what they showed on schools was nothing like when I went inside a slaughterhouse and I saw it for myself, you know, so I like to try and see things for myself. I try not to take in all these, you know, these, these negative things into it until I'm like, let me see for myself. Let me, let me check that out. You know, like, I'm not sure what you're saying, but I kind of, I'll look into it, you know, um, and, and, and maybe see if there's some truth there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a great perspective to have. All right, cool. So is there anything else that maybe you want to share that we didn't share or maybe one big thing that you want to leave the audience with? That if you are considering going vegan, haven't thought about it, or maybe you are thinking about it, I think that you should, like you said earlier, Kevin, not just think about it from your perspective because the people that really have the privilege are the people that have the opportunity to contribute to suffering. We're looking at these issues from the perpetrator's perspective, but we're not looking at it from the victim's perspective. And anytime you look at any type of civil change or resistance, you should look at it from the victim's perspective. So like you said earlier, the people that, like you said, it's two types of vegans, the people, uh, or two types of people that you know, see veganism is easy or hard. And typically those are people that are looking at it either from the victim's perspective or the perpetrator's perspective. So, you know, I think for us to be more compassionate beings, we're going to have to continue to look at issues from the perspective of the victim and not the perspective of the people that have the power to inflict harm and suffering. Because for us, it absolutely is a choice. You know, it's a choice for me or you to consume animal products if we want to, you know, but it's not the choice of an animal to not get their throat slit. It's not their choice to be forced to be pregnant. It's not their choice to have their body altered to produce hundreds of more eggs than they would generally. It's not their choice to get killed at a fraction of their life. They don't have a choice because they are the beings that are being inflicted um, suffering on. We are the beings that are in a position of power. So when you have the opportunity to be in a position of power, it comes with great responsibility. And, you know, we should look after, you know, I've heard a quote, I can't remember where it came from or who said it, or even the exact quote, Um, but it's something to the effect of, um, you know, if you have the knowledge to know you have the duty to act. Yeah, and I think that's, I, that's uh, Albert Einstein, I think. Albert Einstein, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think I paraphrased it. I may not have said it exactly correct. That's the, the gist of it. And that's how I look at the animal rights movement or the rights of animals. 
you know, we have the ability to know that they suffer. We are in a position of power and we are in a position of dominion. So I look at animals in the same way that I would look at children. You know, they are defenseless to us. If you wanted to, you could be the child and you're in a position of power to do so, but would that be ethically right? And I don't think you can ever contribute to suffering and it be ethical when you have the ability not to. So I would just say, I, I guess that's where I would. Yeah, just, and to add, to add to that, I would even say like some people bring up the point where, okay, well, you know, I can't go vegan because the war going on in Syria, or I can't go vegan because the coronavirus or, or these other outlying issues, you know what I mean? But the difference that I have between any of those situations that are happening, and I know about them, and maybe I know about the war going on in Syria, maybe I, I know, about, I definitely know about the coronavirus for sure, I mean, who doesn't? I know about, you know, maybe some other issues going on in the world. The question is, can I make a difference in those, in those situations? Can I fly right now and go to Syria and, and, and try and stop that war? Like, I really can't do that. I have no means to do that. There's no way that that's going to happen. But can I three times a day, you know, choose something better, you know, or choose something that doesn't harm someone else? Like, I can do that. So the question is, is, is I like the practical part of veganism is how do you do something practical? Uh, exactly. And so I would add to that, you know, because sometimes people are like, yeah, I know about this. I know about that, you know, and, and it puts them, it paralyzes them because there's, there's nothing that they could do about it right? But mm -hmm. this is something that we can do. This is something, a very easy, a very easy switch. Yeah, um, yeah so great. Absolutely. So where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you and connect with you? Uh, so if anybody is on social media, the social medias that I frequent are Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But face, uh, Twitter and Instagram is so, S-O-U-L underscore Eubanks, uh, E-U-B-A-N-K-S. So you can find me on either one of those platforms. You can also search uh, facebook.com slash soul um my website is soul and actually my handle on tiktok is also uh so you so underscore you banks so i try to keep them pretty consistent um and if you are just interested in supporting the activism that i do i have a patreon that's patreon.com slash so you banks where i update people about my activism i give them behind the scenes looks at things that I'm doing and working on and just engage with them on a, uh, on a closer level by supporting my Patreon because my goal is to do animal activism as a career. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it's going well, to hopefully be... hopefully it'll end. Hopefully well, it'll yeah, end exactly. and, then, and then you won't have to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And hopefully That's I can cool. just yeah. do whatever else comes along that needs to be fought for. Yeah. Um, but fighting for animals is something that I'm going to be doing for the foreseeable future. And um, that's a way to help support me because I, I don't, I think a lot of us do work that we have to do to, you know, pay our bills and pay our expenses. And I've gotten to a point in my life where I really only want to do work for the sake of making the world a better place. You know, and there's nothing wrong with anybody, you know, having a job to pay your bills, to pay your student loans, or whatever you have to do. You have to do what you have to do to survive. But I've been fortunate enough to try and put myself in a position to where the only work that I want to do is purpose-driven work. So Patreon just helps me, helps support me to reach that goal. So that's a lifelong goal of mine, and Patreon is a way to support that. Yeah, absolutely. And for people that don't know too much about Patreon, Patreon is amazing to helping people like, like um, Soul be a full-time activist and to get out there um, because it's very, there's a lot of costs that go to it. I mean, I got my computer, I have the, my microphone, I have the light, I have the camera, you know, I have all the different equipment that, that goes associated with it, potentially traveling, um, moving around. So some of these things, these things do really add up, you know, and, and in order to give us um, or give activists like you the most time, you know, the Patreon or, or something similar is a very, very useful tool um, to help get that going. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. All Thank right. So, so um, I think that's it. Um, everything went great. Um, I had an awesome time talking to you and getting to know you. Uh, Likewise. So have a great night. I know it's a little bit later over there in the evening. Excellent. All right. Take care, guys, and uh, check this guy out as soon as you guys can. Have a great day. 
Thank you guys for listening to the podcast. Please, please, please make sure that you guys share this with anyone that you think will find this interesting. And also make sure that you guys subscribe because I can see a lot of you guys are listening, but you aren't subscribed. So please subscribe. And also don't forget to go to my website where you can leave comments and see more content at veganluna.com.